See the church. God bless you. Thank you, praise team. Can we praise God for the praise team? Amen. We have a flautist again. Praise God for Christy, and we love our bass player too. Ooh, it's so fantastic. Good to see you, Kaylin. Thank you. Hey, listen. Um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, my tribe, my tribe has grown by one. And uh, amen, amen. And I was handing out these handy dandy bubblegum cigars for a while, but I'm all out of them. And uh, I just want to praise God for my new, newest grandson, Titus Andrew. Amen? Amen. When it, now, I don't smoke cigars, but I do chew bubble gum. Whenever I hold a cigar, I'm always reminded of Groucho Marx. You know, that, that's the prettiest baby I ever saw, you know? So anyway, I want to uh, praise God for, uh, for his goodness in our life. And... Uh, our family. Hey, I, I try not to let my business hang out, you know. I learned a long time ago, I, I am the minister, not the ministry. You are the ministry. But there are a few people in here who I felt the need to share with, who prayed for a pregnancy that, let's put it this way, was concerning. Titus is still in the hospital now, so I'm asking you all to continue to pray. And if you are not continuing to, if you're continuing to pray, but if you're just getting in the know now, please pray for my little grandson and praise God for his mother and father. Are they here today? Where are they? Quincy and Nolan, I heard they were here. They're out in the hallway probably slapping high five to everybody. Uh, here's the thing. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Won't you bow with me as we pray? Father in heaven, greatest God Almighty, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I praise you, Father, for what you're doing in our midst. I pray that you'll help me to preach and teach your word today, Father. That uh, there will be something for each and every person 
uh, in, uh, here present, uh, listening online, YouTube, the website, whatnot, even the radio. Please, God Almighty, use Desert Hills. Use me today. I love you, Father. Thank you for the life of our babies. Thank you, Father God, for your grace and mercy in our lives. We pray that there will be one or two here today who will come to the saving knowledge of the one that makes it all possible, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father God, that those who come and have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus, that they will be soon baptized in, in obedience to what your word has said, that they should be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as always, Father God, I, I pray that you continue to grow Desert Hills with one resurrected, born again, baptized, Christ-adoring Christian at a time. Again, I thank you. Hear these praises from a great, grateful heart, Lord. We love you. We praise you in the precious name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, amen, amen and amen. I had Brother Shannon read out of the book of Matthew in chapter 8. We are in our sermon series this summer uh, that I have titled, So You're Saved, Now What? So you are saved, now what? So often we pray for things, and then once we get them, we don't know what to do with them. Amen? You know, one of the things I've tried to explain to not just my children, but every person I've counseled with, if they, uh, if they have goals or aspirations in life, is to frame their requests to the Lord for what they want, not what they don't want. Oftentimes, we don't want to get sick. Instead of asking God to keep us healthy. Oftentimes we don't want to be poor. Instead of asking God that we might be taken care of. Uh, if you will frame your request today unto the Lord based upon what you want. He already knows what you need before you ask. He already knows what you need before you ask. He already knows the desires of your heart. Today I was sharing with our new members class God's phone number. Anybody here got God's phone number? I do. I got God's phone number back in 1990. I got God's phone number back in 1990 when I cried out to him and I said, I, I don't know what I want. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 33.3 3 says, cry out unto me. Cry out unto me, and I will make known to you great and mighty things that you do not know. My friends, what do you want today? What do you want? You're saved? Now what? What do you want? We're going to be looking at these verses that start with the healing of Peter's mother. Let's talk about that for a moment, and then we'll move forward. Peter's mother-in-law, more specifically... <laughs> Now, some of you are thinking, oh, the mother-in-law, yeah. You know what? why I think the Holy Spirit put that in there, that it was his mother-in-law, not just some, uh, uh, Peter's mother-in-law, not just some other lady or Peter's mom, you know? Well, I think he specifically did that because he knew, knew that we could be able to use that to fight against the heresy of popery. I'm not going to stay too long on this, but uh, Catholic priests are not allowed to marry and here Peter, who is allegedly the first pope, had a mother-in-law. How do you get a mother-in-law? You marry her, her daughter. That's how you get the mother-in-law. Well, Peter does something that's interesting. He brings Jesus to his home. He brings Jesus to his home. How many of us will run home today and, and not bring Jesus with us? How many of us will get in, into the car and turn the radio on and tune out the Lord immediately. How many of us were raised in homes where Jesus was never introduced, let alone welcomed? Uh, I want to encourage you today to take Jesus with you everywhere. He is everywhere anyway. But if you will take him with you everywhere, he is able and willing to heal people from unbelief. Unbelief. 
The healings that Jesus Christ did in the New Testament, you have to know this, they're typological in their performance, if you will. Jesus Christ came and as he healed the lame, as he made the blind to see, as indeed we have spoken, cleansed the leper, he did so as a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. It's not that God wants everybody or no one ever to be sick. No, we live in a lost, dying, and fallen world. People get sick. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but let me share a uh, statistic with you, tried and true. Ten out of ten people will die. There is no one except for Jesus Christ who has risen from the dead and will live forever. My friends, hear me when I tell you this. The, the healings that Christ did uh, were a fulfillment of the prophecies and foreshadows that were demonstrated or spoken of and written down in the Old Testament. Today, when we look at this, uh, when we look at Peter's mother-in-law, bless her heart, we're going to look at someone who was figuratively healed, literally healed from a fever, but figuratively healed, if you will, from unbelief, unto belief in Jesus Christ. You know, uh, Jesus himself said, if you believe me not for what the word says about me, at least believe me because of the signs and wonders I do in your midst. Hawker's paraphrase. Christ came and he did these things as a proof of who he was. Why? Because of the purpose for which he came, which was to seek and save the lost, to die for the dead sinner, those who are dead in their sins and trespasses, that they might be made alive with him unto God the Father. If you're here today and you feel distant from God, maybe you're dead to him. You know how to fix that? Receive the Son. You say, I feel distant from God. Well, God is only as far away from you as you want Him. Jeremiah 33, 3, you go home, look that up today. You put it on your fridge. You put it in your bathroom. It's one of the greatest biblical affirmations that you can have. We decided today in our new members class, God is everywhere. God knows everything. And that God is love. If God is love, he loves you, and all you need to do is call unto him, and he is there, and he is a very present help in a time of need. Here it says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 14, when Jesus come, un, in, uh, come un, into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick with a fever, sick with the fever. Now, you know, I, I remember when... Um, my son was born, he'd get a fever, and we would flip out every time, you know, because it's our firstborn. And every time they get a boo-boo, you kind of freak out. But in the 21st century, a fever is not the end of the world, but a fever could very likely kill you in the first century. There's no aspirin to take, you know, and, and depending on the time of the year, there's no way to get cool or to cool people down. This woman was laid with a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her. Now, before, before I move forward, I want you to know, he is the great physician. Jesus Christ does have the power to heal. He's just not obligated to do so. My grandson is testimony of God's miracle work and healing work even now. Know this, God will heal one of three ways. He will either heal miraculously, he will heal uh, naturally, or he will heal medically. But he's not obligated to do so. But it doesn't hurt to ask him, amen? So if you have an ailment today, if you're not feeling well, if you feel sick, I got a miracle man over here. His name is Art. I got another miracle man in the back row. His name is Rick. He's sitting next to his miracle wife named Rosa. We got another miracle woman over here by the name of Judy. Got another one up here by the name of Joan, jo uh, Joanne. Listen to me, Miss Yoli, Brother Ken. I can go on and on and on about the miracles that have happened within our midst, medically and physically. 
But the greatest miracle of all are those who come to Jesus Christ by faith because they will never die. We can be healed and then we will die. So let us not always and only focus on the temporal, but I don't want to just bypass it. Thank God that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law of this fever. So she was healed. Now what? Same question. So you're saved? Now what? She was healed? Now what? And Jesus touched her, verse 15, and the fever left her, and she arose. Now see, I like that. Peter's mother-in-law doesn't sit and say, well, I'm healed, time to take a nap. You know my favorite type of people in the world, people always go on vacation, and when they come back, they go, I need a rest. <laughs> I'm just exhausted. Hey, man, if your vacation is not restful, you need to do something else for your vacation. You know, but what do we do? We, we work hard at our play and we play hard at our work. That's what we do. And I find the same thing in people's spiritual lives. Oh, they work hard with their hedonism. Oh, they work hard on their play. They work hard for the money, honey. Why? So they can have the TVs, so that they can have the cars, so they can have all of the trappings of life. And then what? They're teaching the class and they get 15 minutes of study before class and they're going over the lesson. Oh, snap. Ruffling feathers. See, uh, God wants us to be in a dialogue with him. God wants us to communicate with him. God wants us to cry out unto him, to call out unto him. He wants to reveal to us great and unknown things that we did not know. But he doesn't want to be second best on the prayer dial. Yep. And by the way, I've got a big screen TV and I've got two cars that work and I've got a very, very nice house. None of those things are wrong. What's wrong is when you do not have those things, but those things have you. See, God wants you. He wants all of you. He doesn't want you in piecemeal. He doesn't want you sometime he. Sometime he got you, sometime he don't. He wants us all, all the time. Do you know why? Not because he's some kind of egotistical, maniacal, megamaniac. It's because he loves you. He loves you. He said, I know he loves me. He loves me just the way I am. That's right. He loved you, past tense, just the way you were. Because even while you were yet still a sinner, he died for you on the cross. Now that you've come to faith and trust in him, arise. Amen. And don't just arise to go strut your stuff. Arise with the purpose in your walk. First thing you do is you arise and do what? You obey. He says, be baptized. What is your problem? Are, are you aquaphobic or something? Come on now. It's only three feet deep. It might even be, it might even be uh, more shallow than that. We need to fill that with some water, Judy. It's only three feet deep, and we put a little chlorine in it to kill all your little grimies in between times. <laughs> he says, arise. What happened? Peter's mother-in-law is healed, and the first thing she does is arise. She doesn't lay back down and say, I'll tell you what, you guys go ahead, fend for yourself. I'm going to go ahead and take a nap. Peter's mother-in-law arose, and what did she do? She ministered unto them. She ministered unto them. Now, here at Desert Hills, I was reminded even in the podcast uh, the other day that I did with my wife. If you haven't checked out the podcast, I interviewed the missus, and uh, I just want to say she did a fantastic job. So grateful for her. Uh, difficult for her to do those things, but I'm grateful for her. But she even uh, uh, mentioned that here at Desert Hills, we have a policy that we wait one year after somebody joins the church before they are able to be considered to teach here or to minister in an official sense. That doesn't mean unofficially you can't minister. You know, when was the last time you walked somebody to their car? When was the last time, when was the last time we had a gathering here that you helped set up or tear down? You see, that's easy to do. You say, well, I, don't, I can't do that. I got a bad back. Fantastic. Did you know we have 
that, that, that you could pray anytime, anywhere for anybody. Arise, minister. Now, I don't share all the, th I don't share all my uh, things in my life with you, but I can tell you this right now. This church needs prayer. Do you know how I know this church needs prayer? I said, well, because you're the pastor. No, you know how I know this church needs prayer? Because it's got people in it, man. People need prayer. People need prayer. My friends, uh, you're saved. Now what? Get up. Get off your blessed assurance. Pray. Pray. Everybody lift up your right hand. Hold out all your fingers. See? See how many, finger, how many fingers you got? God have mercy. Hopefully no one maimed in here. Five fingers. Fantastic. You can pray for your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your cousin. You can pray for your uh, nephew, your niece, your grandchildren, the person that you go get your hair done by, and your Uber driver. I'm challenging you now, you who are newly born again, arise and find five people in your life that you don't know know Jesus. And I'm challenging you right now to pray that they will come to the saving knowledge of the risen Christ. And if you can't think of five unsaved people, because again, like we were talking about in our new members class today, as you become a Christian, you, the moment you become a Christian, you will never have more unsaved friends than at that point in your life. Because if you're growing in Christ, you're going to be, want to be around Christians more and more. So you will gain Christian friends and your Christian family will continue to grow and your biological family, which usually stays pretty static, unless there's a newborn like we've had, uh, they will stay uh, the same, and your non-Christian friends will diminish. So now's the time. Now's the time. You're born again, brand new born again Christian. Now's the time to earmark five people in your life to pray that their eyes will be opened. Don't pray that God fix them. I say, oh, I'm, you know, I can't wait for it. I'm going to pray for my uncle. That guy's a jerk. No, that's, it's, see, what are you doing? Is that retribution or do you want to see him saved? You know, hey, God would will that all come unto salvation through Jesus Christ. Man, woman, black, white, does not matter. He loves us all. So arise and minister Maybe not here for, at first in an official capacity, right? But if there are things, uh, you know, I, 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 hey, I'm going to give out some plugs. Okay, Joanne? You know how you could minister? Are you ready for this? I, I come up with these things so we can have fun, Geo, Liz. But the truth of the matter is you want to minister? Go out and look for these banners and take pictures of them. Put them on your Facebook. He said, oh, he's just plugging his programs again. Listen to me. Do you know the most uh, visible part about the banner? Is the Jesus heart you. Jesus loves you. That's the message. You go out there, you put it on your Facebook, right? And if all they see is Jesus heart you, at least they'll know who you heart. Right? You put it on your Facebook, you get likes and shares. You don't know what God's going to do with that. The simple message that Jesus loves you. My son-in-law sent me a, a video here recently of Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow was recounting uh, about a playoff game or a game that they won in order to go into the playoffs. And uh, I, I don't know if it was a trainer or someone, uh, uh, somebody close to him called him and said, Tim, can you believe what just happened, you know, after the game? Tim says, oh, yeah, I can't, you know, it was amazing. We won this game. We're going to go into the playoffs. He goes, no. And I'm probably going to get all the stats wrong, but. Just bear with me. You will get the picture. He says, um, you threw for 316 yards. It, it was 3 and 16 when you converted the pass. Three, it was third down and, and 16 yards, so you completed the pass. We're exactly 
three and some odd day or 16, whatever. All the numbers lined up to 316. But here's the key. He was wearing 316, you know, on his eyebrows or I think right here on this. He was wearing John 316. And he said, millions of people, Google has reported that millions and millions and millions of people have searched John 316 through Google after the game. Man, John 316, you would think everybody knows John 316. It's the love of God that compels us. Amen? It's the love of God and by his mercies that we are saved. And that we arise and minister to others. Verse 16. And when even uh, was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils and cast out the spirits with his words and healed all that were sick. Hey, do you think they told somebody? Word gets out about Jesus. Word gets out. Wednesday night, I, I spoke and I said, you know, if, it, if, if today somebody were uh, to rise from the dead after being buried in a tomb for three days, it should be front page news, you would think. I don't know, in today's modern media, they'd probably spin it to say something crazy. But what I can tell you is this, he is risen. And we ought to talk about it. Because it's the only thing that matters is eternal life with God the Father. They indeed told someone. And it goes on in verse 17, that it may, might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah, uh, Isaiah the prophet, saying himself took our affirmities and bear our, uh, bear our sickness. Turn with me to uh, Isaiah 53, if you will. Isaiah 53. Now this is key because the health of, the prosperity and the health and wellness gospel preachers will tell you that God doesn't want you sick and you need to rebuke your sickness. Hey, if I don't feel well, I, say, I, just, I don't feel well. I just call it like it is and I ask God, God, help me feel better. I don't feel well, help me feel better. If I'm sick, I say, God, I think I'm sick. I don't know what I got, but help me feel better and, help, and heal me. We're here in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. Matthew quotes this. As a direct hearkening, a direct uh, a touchstone, if you will, back to Jesus being prophesied before he came. What is prophecy? Well, prophecy today in the Old Testament is, is the foretelling of our history. <laughs> prophecy in the Old Testament is the foretelling of our history, most of it. There's still some that's going to be coming true, even as Jesus Christ will return. And he's going to smite the nations with the word. But here, here Isaiah the prophet says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Smitten of God and afflicted. Turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter in chapter 2. 1 Peter in chapter 2. Is it, did he heal? Our wounds and our and and, and take sins uh, take uh, the the stripes for us so that we could always be happy and and never have a hiccup. Well, Peter says here in First Peter chapter two and verse thirty four, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins dead to sins, should be alive unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. By whose stripes we are healed. You've been healed, healed unto God. A relationship that was irrevocably broken, uh, irretrievable uh, by human effort, if you will, has been healed. And here, here Peter explains that it was on a tree, the tree of the cross, that Jesus Christ died that we might be healed. So you're saved? Now what? Well, you still might get the sniffles. But you're saved. So you're saved? Now what? Arise. Arise. Arise out of the tomb of unbelief. Drop the, 
the garments that once were so stained with sin, wash yourself in the righteousness of Christ and minister and minister. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. I added 20 just because I love the thought of being an ambassador, an ambassador of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be what? Sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You think it's all about healing your corns and your bunions? You think it's all about getting the best report on your cancer diagnosis? You've been made alive unto God, that we might be made the righteousness of God by him. Turn back with me to Isaiah chapter 53 and let us look here again at this famous prophecy. Isaiah chapter 53, and we will read 5 and 6. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Does God heal? Amen. He, he's the great physician. I've witnessed it. I've already mentioned a half a dozen names. And I've witnessed it in my own life. But this is temporal. What he would heal physically today. Know this. It compares nothing to the spiritual healing that we have through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. All like sheep, verse 6, we have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ took our punishment. Christ didn't deserve to die. The fact of the matter is, if Christ hadn't sacrificed himself, Christ would have never died. Why? Well, because he hadn't earned it. See? See? The wages of sin. You earn a wage. Anybody here work for a living? Amen? You earn a wage. The wages of sin is death. Ah, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. No, my friends, I will tell you today that if you are a born-again believer and you have been baptized, it's time to get up and begin to minister. Is the world getting better? You know, I remember, I remember years ago, this is a long time ago. Everything seems to be years ago now. Years ago when I made the proposal for uh, our solar panels. Thank God for the solar panels, you know. I made the proposal for the solar panels to our uh, financial team. And uh, remember that, George Ann? We were sitting there, and boy, we just thought, well, that's a, that's a hefty chunk of cash. I said, well, they want us to have some skin in the game, and I like that. We take some ownership in this, see what God does. Say, Lord, we're going to step out on faith. By the way, just a little, little plug about faith. The waters don't part until you get in them. There was one thing, Moses was there. He, he said, let the waters part, you know, staff over the waters, Red Sea. That's when you baby. Ah, but once, you, once you've gone through those waters, guess what? Put the foot in the water, the waters will part. You know, that's a whole other story. But I said, you know... I made my best pitch. You know, I thought I was on like, um, what is that show? Uh, what was Trump's show where he says, you're fired? The Apprentice. I thought I'd go in there and make my best pitch for this because I thought it was a good idea. So I made my best pitch and I said, here's the thing. Summer's not going to get any cooler. Summer doesn't ever get cooler here in Las Vegas. I mean, we, we, have a, we had a, a few days extra of less than 100 degree temperature. Praise God for that, right? And the other thing you can count on in Las Vegas is that the, the summers will never get any cooler. And, and very rarely, very rarely if ever, 
do, does the uh, power or the energy rates go down. Now, they say they go down, but see, it's just like anything else. They up at 10 bucks and then down at 2. So you're paying an extra 8, and you thank God for that. But I said, I could guarantee you this. Whether we get the solar panels or not, whether God provides for them or not, whether we step into the water and the waters will part or not, it's not going to get cooler in the summer, and the power bills will just go up. Well, thank God Desert Hills had enough faith to move forward. And now what, do we, what Judy had a $32 power bill the other day? Well, what's holding you back? You've got to get up. You've got to move. Faith, faith is an action word. Faith is an action word. It's not an adjective. It doesn't describe something. It's an action word. Faith requires, faith requires us to do something, not to be saved, but because we are saved. That's the difference. See, one would say, well, if you don't do A, B, and C, you can't go to heaven. I would say I do A, B, C, and D, E, and F because I am going to heaven. Not out of a, a fear-based religion that I'm not going to please God. Or I'm going to upset God. But by faith, I look at the scripture. And the scripture tells me it's impossible to please God without faith. And he likened it unto Abraham as righteousness because he believed God. But he didn't just believe God and sit in a corner. He believed God and he got up and he did what God said to do. What God said to do. So you're saved. Now what? Well, what did God say to do? God said, Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and, and, and uh, have, with heavy labor. He says, come unto me, my yoke is light. I will give you rest. And so I came unto him. Great. Now what? Well, now, if you love him, you obey him. That's what he said. Don't take it up with him. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And the first thing he commanded is what? What, church? Somebody said it. Baptism. Whole Baptist church, Nolan, not, only got one person. The first thing that Jesus said to do after you come into faith is to do what? Baptism. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm up here all by myself, Bob. Help me out, man. Hey, first thing is baptism. And then after baptism, right? You're seeking the Lord in your daily walk every day. He wants you to do that. And you arise up every day and seek the Lord in what he would have you do. Now, there's always going to be the monotonous things, the minutia of life that we will do with our limbic system without even thinking about it. It's the purposeful, like putting on your shoes, brushing your teeth, at least once a month, whether you need it or not. But the, what, what we're talking about is what would God have us do purposefully out of, after all of those things? What would he have us do? Well, I've already mentioned one, praying for others. Praying for others. Reading your word. Trusting in him to speak to you through his word. And you say, well, I don't really have time for that. You know... Uh, I, I, have, I have read and followed so many people over the years. I won't mention his name, but he's a DR period, and I like this guy. He recently passed here, and uh, he's going to be sorely missed. I won't mention his name because I don't agree with everything he says, but he's, he's got a, an interview that he does, and you know what he said? He said, uh, I, uh, he says, my education, my Bible knowledge is the accumulative work of 15 minutes a day. And I went, what? A DR period? This guy got his master's in theology and he got his doctorate in divinity. Do you know what that, that means? I had to find out myself because I might be going for a master's soon. God have mercy. Uh, a, a doctorate in divinity means that he speaks Hebrew and Greek fluently. And he said... That his entire education and biblical knowledge is the accumulative work of 15 minutes of study a day. Now he said he started when he was a teenager. 
but why don't you just start with five minutes a day? Five minutes a day. You know, here at Desert Hills, we're doing everything we can to reach everybody that we can. I, I write a devotional Monday through Friday on Instagram. And trust me when I tell you, it is not because I'm some kind of egomaniac that I need your, your likes and your views. I, you know, I can't say I could care less because it is kind of cool when I see somebody heart something I've done or comment. That's kind of neat, but I don't live for it, you know. I, I do it because you know what? I think if they're going to be reading something on the Internet today, maybe they'll read this verse and some thoughts about this verse. We, we're putting, we've done, started doing the podcast. Why? Like I told Bill, Bill who's accumulated all these wonderful gadgets like Batman, you know. Uh, he's accumulated all these wonderful gadgets and toys for us to be able to do this. Bill and I, we talk often to make sure our priorities are set. We want to know and, and want to be able to uh, go before the Lord and say we did everything we could with all that we had to reach everyone within that ministry that you gave us. The website, it goes on and on and on. Sunday school, think about the Sunday school teachers here. Think about, think about just the elementary department, the preschool, and the youth upstairs. Think about the adults that steward over our children who pray and, and I'm going to say this, I believe labor all week long in the studies that they are presenting to our children. You could pray for them. You could pray for them. No, we're doing everything that we can here that we know how to do. If you are newly born again, the first thing to do is to be baptized. Well, we know, as with the leper, the first thing to do is to praise. Praise God. And then after praising him, what do we do? Well, then we are baptized and continue to move forward in that vein of obedience. Yes, these things were spoken of in Isaiah chapter 53. Now when Jesus, verse 18, back in Matthew again, chapter 8. Now when Jesus saw a great multitude about him, he gave commandment to depart to the, unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee where, where, with or ever so thou goest. Now this sounds like one of these guys. Man, he's a hard charger. He's really going to follow Jesus wherever he goes. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. That's a weird way to respond to somebody who said they're just going to they're gonna follow you anywhere. I had a meeting with a young man this, this last week who, um, who surrendered his life to the ministry. And we're going to do everything we can to uh, come alongside him and help him. Um, I, 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 specifically, he thought about teaching. I said, do me a favor. I'm going to use the restroom. Uh, get your phone out. Look up how many times teacher or teaching is in the New Testament. So I knew what verse I was looking for. So he says, I found it. And I said, is it in that book of James you got there? And he goes, yeah, yeah. I said, would you read that out, out loud to me? And he says, ought not many of you want to be teachers lest you fall into a greater condemnation? I said, oh, snap. That's Jesus' half-brother. He goes, yeah. I said, that doesn't sound very encouraging. What does it say? He says that we should not want to be teachers. Why? Because you're going to be judged. That's why. You're going to fall under a stricter judgment. We Invariably, the, the conversation that this young man and I had fell to my children. I said, you know, we were able to, God spared us of my children growing up in the fishbowl of the ministry of being pastor's children until they were in their late teens, early 20s. And I go, but know this, that fishbowl exists. That fishbowl exists. Uh, Jesus here, and, and why I mention all of this is because I'm trying to let this young man know, hey, ministry is not what you think. Ministry is not what you think. First of all, ministry is not shake and bake. It's not shake and bake. Ministry, for the most part, is down and dirty. And Jesus responding to this young man that says, I will follow you wherever you go. He lets him know, I'm homeless. You follow me wherever you go, I'm homeless. 
Now, some of you say, well, Pastor, I, you know, I like, I like you, cut of your jib. I'm going to be like you when I grow up. Really? Now, you come to my house, you're going to get a false sense of who I really am. The house that I live in was bought by a, a grocery clerk's and a dental assistant's wage. I, I'm driving the same cars I've driven for 20 years, literally. Uh, godless, godliness is not a means for gains, folk. Jesus says, you want to follow me? I'm homeless. How do you like me now? He says, well, I tell you what, let me, let me go bury, bury my, one of my kin. He says, let the dead bury the dead. You come now. With me or against me. See, God don't like some tiny people. God doesn't like lukewarm Christians. In or out the house, that's what he says. In the house or out the house, be one of the two. Don't straddle. You know, it's kind of what my son preached on, that uh, half donkey religion. He said half ass, because ass is in the Bible, but that half donkey religion, you know. One foot in, one foot out. You're lukewarm. No, my friends, you're saved. Now what? Arise. Be baptized. Why? I'll tell you why, and then we'll close. Well, we arise, and we can minister to others through our baptism. Did you know that? Let's take a look at our baptistry up here. What is that baptistry other than a big old tub? Well, it represents judgment and death. Remember the first time that the Lord destroyed the world? How did he judge the world? By water. In the flood. In the flood. So when you go under the water, you're telling everybody that you are gone under judgment with Jesus, who was what? Made sin. That we might become and be made the righteousness of God by him. We go under the water and we minister to everyone who is here who has A, already gone unto the water, or B, to people who do not yet know what it means to go under the water. And we say, you are now buried with Christ in baptism and risen again to walk in what? The newness of life, which is Jesus Christ. It's a picture, folks. It's a symbol. It's an outward sign of an inward change. We've gotten away from this. Do you know there are churches? I, my wife was telling me this the other day as a part of our pre-interview for the podcast. She says, there's churches that say, okay, everybody, anybody here want to get baptized? We got the tub. And then they go, oh, I want to be baptized. They run forward and dunk. Oh, in the name of Jesus, go. You, you know who should be baptized? Someone who has confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Someone who understands that he has come to forgive them of their sins. And they have confessed that they are a sinner. You never confess you're a sinner. You never ask for forgiveness of your sin. What did you do? You just got wet. That's all you did. You weren't obedient unto God. That's a, that's a nothing thing. Nothing. No. See, here at Desert Hills, we know we have two ordinances. The Lord's Supper and baptism. So arise. Be baptized. And then what? Minister. You've ministered through baptism to everyone that's here. You know why we do the baptism is at the beginning so well? Because it ministers to us. Oh, man, when I, see, when I see or I know there's a baptism before we worship, I know God is pleased. You know when your Savior was baptized. That's right. Jesus was baptized. He was, he was baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist. It says that the, the clouds parted and a voice said, Behold, my son, in whom I am well pleased. I am well pleased. Don't you want to be well pleasing to the Father? Then you must walk by faith. And the only way to walk by faith is to arise and be obedient. 